Hi, I'm Matt Turner. I am the replacement for the person who couldn't make the last lot. I got, I am a last minute, second rate stand in. I got a, I got a phone call at like 1130 last night. So this is not great. But surprise, yeah, right. Celebrity surprise, one of those intimate little gigs that you never hear about. Right, one of them. Um, I'm going to try and talk about networking and um, a bit of the Linux stuff that plays into that. It's not going to be as low level as as we just heard, that was an awesome talk, by the way. Um, but we will talk about containers and namespaces and stuff. Uh, so if you've ever wondered how networking in Docker actually works, and we will talk about the dreaded K word. I know this is Docker London, but we'll go into Kubernetes land and then we will come back. We will be safe again. Um, so I'm just going to go through that. I don't know how long it's going to take, but I stand between you and the pub. So I'll start. Um, so Network interfaces, right? And bridges, we think we know what these are. My computer has a hole in the back and my, like, I buy this switch and it has holes in the front and we plug them together. So imagine I have a computer, it's like a gray box, like in the 90s, and I've got a network interface. I've got um, a way for packets, you know, the magic, magic electricity to come in and out. So this, this has a name, this is ETH0 on Linux. If it's like Ethernet device zero, the first Ethernet device, and these days they're giving them BSD names based on their bus location or whatever. So you may have seen this kind of EMP0S2 kind of name, but this is a network interface that you know everybody's familiar with if you've ever used like a Linux or even an OS X computer. And you know, I can give that thing an IP address and I, I can use it. We can talk a million protocols, but we only really care about IP these days. So if I give it an IP address, uh, the right kind of IP address and plug it into the right thing, I can use it to get, download pictures of cats. Right, and to test my connectivity to the cat server, uh, we can say use ping. So this green box is like a process. This is a Linux user space process. Uh, and as low level as we're gonna get is I'm gonna tell you that the system, the system call to in initiate a TCP connection to something else is called connect. Obviously ping doesn't use TCP. Somebody was meant to put their hand up, but we can, we can connect from a process through you know, using an IP address and the, the internet happens and we can get to Google. And we can also have another kind of process that wants to listen instead, that wants to be a web server and receive connections, something like an Nginx, and it can say it wants to bind. That's the system call to say, listen, in this case, on, on port 80. And back in the day, we used to do sort of complicated networking things. Um, we used to plug another, we used to take the side off the computer, and we used to plug another network card in, like another PCI card. Uh, and it had another hole in the back of our computer, and that would be called ETH1. And we could give it a different IP address. Uh, and then our computer could kind of be addressed in two different ways. It's like, you know, if you call me Matt and I react in one way, if you call me Matthew, then I guess you're my mother, like, and I react in a different way. <laughs> so really same, same gray box, different, you know, different um, reactions when you call. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, if you call me Matty, I'm like, I'm not that guy from the boy band in the nineties. Why, why would you ever use that name? Um, so I combine specifically Nginx can say, right, I want to, I only want to talk to like the people who are going to address me as 192.168 something and not the 172.16. And the reason for this is that back in the day, if, you know, we were using one, boxes were kind of difficult and they were expensive and they took up space and, and power. Um, so if we wanted to run two servers, like a web server and another kind of server, rather than actually having two boxes, we could just run the two on the same, on the same box because we had these like multi-processing operating systems. And it was often easier for, for security reasons and firewalling rules and whatever um, traffic management to just literally give them each their own PCI card and their own actual physical wire. So we could do things like this, but it's a bit, it's a bit old school. Uh, and yeah, indeed Nginx could just say it wanted to listen on the other address, you know, get packets down the other wire instead. But what actually is this E0 thing? You know, let's turn that arrow into a, you're making me seasick. Uh, let's, um, can you play the Krabulon song? I'm gonna, so E0 was maybe uh, an interface card, right? So maybe an Intel one, E1000 is a type of Intel gigabit in, uh, ethernet card. I'm gonna draw it bigger because there's, you know, there's, there's stuff to it. So this ETH0, when you do um, an IF config or an IP linked list or one of these software commands that looks over the list of interfaces in your system, you would see ETH0, but that really is kind of a piece of software. That's, that's something that the kernel cooks up. Um, and in this case, it's representing like an actual 
piece of silicon and plastic that I can plug a wire into. And really this is made of the hardware, the bit that's hard that I can touch and a bunch of software, right? The, the driver and then all of the shit in the Linux kernel that we talked about, the TCP stack and, and Netcon, um, NC and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and actually in the middle, anything that sits between the hardware and the software is called the firmware because firm is like halfway between hard and soft. Um, but a lot of this is a figment actually of the software's imagination and the fact that, no, honestly, that's why firmware is called firmware. Um, the fact that you can give this thing an IP address is actually a function of the fact that from sort of driver up, there's a whole load of common code in Linux that deals with IP and probably even Ethernet and TCP to, to be able to listen to certain ports and whatever else. So what if I want another kind of thing, another kind of get of packets in and out of my system? Let's call it a, not an ETH, but a, like a foo. This one's coming from sort of the outside world as if we actually have to have some, some copper to bring our packets down. But what if it was just a complete figment of our imagination? What if it was software all the way down? You know, what, what would this mean? What could it do? Well, I can have an interface that isn't, doesn't get its packets from and send its packets to a PCI card that then, you know, raises and lowers electrons on a wire. I can have this backed by another user space process. So I can give this thing an IP address and like before, my ping program can say it wants to ping routing rules aside, can say it basically wants to send packets down this wire. And rather than that resulting in electricity flowing down some, down some copper, it gets delivered to just another process in the system, right? Just another running uh, binary. You know, I've called this one packet D because it's a daemon that deals with packets, right? Um, and it's actually only two or 300 lines of C to write something that can, that can take a ping, you know, take it apart, take the ICMP apart, take the IP apart, take the ethernet frame apart, um, and put together a response that looks plausible and send it back. And actually you can then ping, rather than pinging Google, you can ping your own little piece of C that you wrote. And it, it is only a couple of hundred lines. Um, the next thing, just as an aside, that we might want to do is in not only give this, this interface an IP address, because it's possible for interfaces to be like IP only, we can pretend, we can really, really pretend that it is uh, an Ethernet card on an Ethernet network, and we can give it a MAC address so that it can actually deal in, in sort of Ethernet frames as well. And that, that's kind of by the, by the by, but it becomes, it does become important. So like I could take this machine and I could take the wire that comes out of here, and I could, you know, plug it into a switch and it would go click. If, I'm, if I can simulate something like a network device that can respond to pings just in software and I can have software that thinks it's a network interface, you know, hardware and firmware and software, but it, it isn't really, then I can just write a program that emulates a bridge, right? One of the switches that we plug into. Uh, and indeed, there's a thing in the Linux kernel called the Linux bridge. And that is a software implementation of one of the Netgear things you've got at home or one of those big extensive Cisco things that's in a rack in, you know, in the, one of the cabinets in your office. And when I've got that bridge, I can plug my two interfaces into it. And then the packets will flow just as if I'd got two physical computers and I plug two wires in. So I can simulate, start to sort of simulate a network within my machine, just using all these kernel features. Uh, and on one side is real computers and on the other side is this user space program that I've written. Some interesting shit happens when you plug these interfaces in. Remember before these interfaces both had an IP address, so I could bind to them, I could connect through them. Um, I can't do that anymore. When you plug one in it, to a bridge, it kind of becomes subsumed almost. It can't take an IP address anymore. I can't bind to it or connect through it because it's plugged into a bridge, right? It's not kind of available for use. Only, only the sort of dangling arrows in my machine are IP addresses I can, are like interfaces I can see if I do an IF config. Uh, anything that's kind of plugged into a bridge is is not available because the kernel's taking care of all the all the packets that come through it. But because this happens, because this is quite common, you know, if I take if I do this, I want to connect my magic packet D to the internet so that other people can can get pings from my packet to show how clever a programmer I am and I can respond to these things. I then can't get my cat gifts. I can't connect to the internet because the thing that had the IP address on is, is kind of gone away. All it's done is it's plugged into, you know, I can't, I can't sort of look down it and see the cats because it's plugged into this bridge. So what I have to do instead is, luckily this is a very common problem. So we want to avoid this. So every bridge, every Linux bridge, every software bridge has a built-in 
uh, connection coming out. So this isn't like a hole you can plug into, but this is like an interface. So imagine another wire with one end plugged into the bridge and one end dangling, right? Every bridge has one of those built in um, that you can give an IP address to. So we can now carry on. We can now see the cats, bind Nginx to it because we've got a dangling arrow. Uh, and the bridge provides that because as I say, it's such a common thing take all your interfaces, you plug them into the bridge and then you don't have any connectivity. So we can give this thing the IP address and we can use it. Confusingly, it always has the same name as the bridge. If you do IF config and you see BR0, you are not seeing the bridge. IF config does not manipulate bridges. I lost like half a day to this. <laughs> IF config does not manipulate bridges. It manipulates, BR0 is the, I think it's called the internal port of the bridge. It's an interface that's like a I don't want to gender all this stuff, but like masculine and feminine is quite an easy way to think of it. It's the arrow, not the hole. Oh, it's just a screensaver. <laughs> Damn it. Um, what was I even saying? Yeah, so every bridge has one of those. You're seeing the interface, not the bridge. BRCTL is the way to manipulate bridges and do things to them. That just, I just lost a lot of time to that. So PacketD was a bit boring. What can we use to, to back this interface? What can we use to pull packets in and out of this thing that might be a little bit more interesting? Well, it turns out there's a user space process. There's a piece of software you can download called QMU. And QMU emulates an entire other machine. It's just a user space process. You can compile it yourself and do dot slash QMU. But QMU is, I've, I've spoiled it now. QMU is an emulator. So we can get a bit meta and actually, you know, QMU is going to respond to, to, to packets, going to respond to network traffic in all kinds of interesting ways because it can emulate a whole system and I can install an operating system on it and a whole bunch of other software. And it gets a bit meta where, you know, this thing's being backed by a process that's actually some emulation code pretending to be an E1000, pretending to have an interface, pretending to have an IP address. But it does all work. And this gets, I mean, this is just your basic 80s virtualization, right? Hypervisation, power virtualization gets like super complicated. No, I won't go there because this is a little bit old. So we can do this and it works, but VMs are clunky, right? We don't like VMs. They have all kinds of problems. So Docker London, what if I had another couple of these user space processes? and I wanted to kind of connect them into this bridge. I wanted to pretend, I wanted them to be like a little VM full of stuff. Um, and I wanted them to be separate from the host to have their own IP address and to kind of plug in and interact with my little virtual network. I need some kind of box to put them in. Let's make that box orange. <laughs> so that box is a container, right? And this is basically, and we'll go into how, but this is basically what a container does. It ring fences the networking of these two processes here. So the other part of the thing we need is remember I said before, you know, this is a real interface. It's, it's backed by the software is talking to silicon to do stuff. The one before, you know, the arrow that came out was, was part of the switch. And I said, imagine that was a wire that was already plugged into the switch at one end and I could sort of dangle it around at the other. Imagine if I could just magic up two of these interfaces, like a dangling wire with, you know, with both ends unplugged and I can do what I want with them. Well, I can, and that's a thing in Linux called a VETH pair, a VE, virtual ethernet pair. So these things, you make two interfaces and they always come in pairs. So you always get a zero and a one, and they've got a virtual wire between them. So anything you send in here comes out here and vice versa. And if I made another VETH pair, I'd get two and three. They have to come in pairs. So what I can do is plug, I can give them IP addresses. I can plug one end into the bridge. And on the other, this other end is, is dangling, right? So it can take an IP, it can be used, but it can only be used by things outside of this orange box because this orange box is a, is a boundary, it's a network boundary. But I can, with a magical syscall, dangle it inside the box and then these two can use it. So now the, the host, if you want, the machine has this IP address and, and BR0 is the, the place the default route's gonna go, right? That's the interface it uses to connect to the internet. And then inside the box, the thing has a different IP because the VETH1 is the interface it's going to use to connect to the internet. This is where you're at your default route and all traffic comes in and out through that. And then to be super sneaky, we can rename that interface to ETH0 and the name won't clash because it's inside the box and the box isolates everything. Rename it to ETH0. So then if you exec into a container, right, or you've ever done Docker run Alpine, Docker run BusyBox, you do IF config, you see ETH0. It looks like you've got an ETH0, but it's not this ETH0. 
and it's not the thing that your host is using to connect to the internet. It's actually one end of a VEF pair. So that's in a nutshell, kind of how Docker connects things to the internet. And I can have mo multiple of these orange boxes and I make multiple VEF pairs, plug them all into the bridge. And that is on a single host, kind of how Docker does things. Oh, and you can replace the VEF pair with one of those host ports for, uh, you know, in internal ports for performance reasons. So I'll just expand a bit while I'm here on what containers are, and I think this will segue nicely into actually what the other two people talked about. Um, I'm good. What, what is a container? So we've talked about the orange box that's now pink, because I put these slides together in a meeting, um, which is this, this network boundary. It's called a namespace. So it's this network namespace. Um, FreeBSD is pretty cool. FreeBSD is pretty cool. Plan 9 is a better operating system. So no, the, the concept of namespace is the, if anybody's ever used um, Chirrut, right, in Linux, um, if anybody's ever used Jails in FreeBSD or Zones in Solaris, any of these sort of software isolation mechanisms for taking a process and limiting the file system that it can see, limiting the memory it can see, all of that kind of stuff. Even, you know, if a process runs with a different user ID to another process, there's files you can't read, there's memory pages you can't map, you know, there's shit you can't do. Um, so the idea of Plan 9 had this, this idea of, of everything being kind of namespaced in this way and being strongly isolated. Um, and it took it to a, to a magical extreme and it was uh, quite hard to use, but Linux has sort of inherited that. Um, and network, so this pink box is the network namespace that isolates networks. But a container, so a container isn't a thing, right? A, nowhere really in the kernel source code will you find the world, the word container. It's not a first class thing. There isn't a system call that says, make me a container. What there is, is a system call that says, make me a new network namespace, isolate a part of the network, please. And you can also isolate five other things. So there are five other namespaces in a Linux system. We can also isolate, uh, as we've seen, the PID namespace, right? So when I'm running in this container and I run PS, if I've got a shell in here and I run PS, I can see the Nginx from my Nginx container, but I can't see anything else. I can't see anything in another container and I can't see anything outside on the host. And we also isolate UTS, which is basically the host name for the, for the system. So you, this can have a different host name. Uh, I isolate the set of user IDs and group IDs that are known so they can overlap and they, they, they don't, they're not equivalent to each other. Um, I can isolate IPC that stops you doing like system five IPC and SHM and weird old stuff, but it's a security vector if you don't shut it off. Um, and I can also, isolate the mount namespace so that when you look at the file system in a Linux system it's a combination of all the things in your mount table right you know you mount a, some, a disk at forward slash and then you mount things over the top of that so if you've got a different table then when you do an ls somewhere on the disk you're going to see different things it's like imagine chiroot on steroids basically and if you think about it a container has to have this mount namespace because it's running from a container image so this, this process here has to see a different disk to the host because it might be running, you know, it might be running from Alpine or whatever. It might be running even from scratch. It might be running a completely different user space, a completely different operating system. So the mount space kind of namespace kind of has to exist. And that's how you like chirrut into the container namespace and then the container image, sorry. And then the rest of them are very much a best practice. And we've, we've talked about why you might actually want to tear this down and not have a PID namespace or not have a user namespace so that you can interact with things from the wider host. But by and, by and large, every container has all six of these barriers up. It also has a mechanism I haven't shown called C groups, which are like hardware isolation. If this is software isolation, you run these things in a C group and they stop you using too many CPU cycles, allocating too much RAM, using too much network bandwidth. So the dreaded K word, Kubernetes. If anybody's used Kubernetes, you know they have this concept of a pod. That's like when you do Docker run, you run a container. In Kubernetes, you do kubectl run and you run a pod. That's the minimum unit of stuff that you can get running. So a pod can just can be one container. I'm trying to not say contain container because I've had too many beers and it's going to go wrong for me and for you. But a pod can comprise more than one, more than one container if you want it to. But it's not just two containers that happen to be started together. It's a Kubernetes pod um, is two containers that are more tightly coupled than that. They share some of these namespaces. So actually a Kubernetes pod, say an Nginx pod made of an Nginx container and a, a proxy container, 
are, they each have their own mount namespace. They have to, because they're running from different images. Th this process and this process have to see different file systems. They, up until recently, had separate PID namespaces, so they couldn't see each other's processes, but that has changed. But they had the same UTS namespace. So one pod, just like a container, thinks it has a host name, you know, one of those random sort of 10 character strings. And both of these things, if you had a shell in either of those, if either of these processes made the right syscall, they would see the same host name. Not the host name out here, but they would see the same as each other because they're in this one UTS namespace. Same with user IDs, same with their ability to system five fuck with each other, and same with their network namespace. And as I said recently, PID namespace is now being, you can opt in, it's a security risk because if you, sh if you can see each other's processes, you can signal them. And you can also, through a very obvious side channel, read the other one's disk. So you can break into from one mount namespace into another if you can do if you can see the PID namespace. So it's optional and it's off by default, but it, it often makes a lot of sense. So this network namespace, as I said, all of these isolate various things. They're maybe not that interesting. But the network one, we've already said, you know, this ETH0 interface is not the same as the ETH0 interface in another container. They're all actually one end of a VEF pair and they're all plugged into a bridge. And that's how all the containers talk to each other. And they talk to the internet because the, the actual hosts like physical PCI card is plugged into the bridge as well. But it also isolates sockets, um, Unix domain sockets, listen sockets, any of that kind of stuff. You have your own loopback interface. So these things can talk to each other over loopback, but that's not the same loopback as another container. So you can use that as a sort of secure messaging channel. Um, it isolates the root table, which is interesting, and it isolates the IP tables rules. So I can set up an IP tables rule, if I have the correct privileges, I can set up an IP tables rule. Any of these things can, can issue the right calls to set up an IP tables rule, and it will only apply within this namespace, within this pink box. So it'll apply to both of these containers, but no others. So the interesting use for this is what's called the sidecar pattern in Kubernetes. So I might say have an Nginx web server and then have uh, an HTTP proxy like Nginx or like in this case, Envoy. And it will sit alongside the Nginx container. It's a separate container, you know, built by a different person, different image, but it share, it's they're seeing the one network interface and they're sharing IP tables rules. Which means that if Nginx listens on port 8080, Envoy can arrange it such that it intercepts all the traffic. So any traffic coming in on ETH0, you know, Nginx is bound to 8080 TCP on ETH0, but with some IP tables rules, we can say, you know what, I want to intercept that first. I want it to come through me, and then I'll fire it back at loopback, and hey, Nginx, fuck you, you can pick it up from loopback later. And that's what it does. And this is a very blank, this is a blanket TCP rule, right? This is like a, you know, IP tables dash F, IP tables dash fuck you, I want all the traffic, right? It's really a brutal rule and it would take your host down and it's a very dangerous thing to be able to do. But if you isolate it within this um, network namespace, within this pod, it does basically exactly what you want. And this is how the sidecar pattern works for service meshes. If you've heard of Linkerd or Istio or Console Connect, this is how they're able to do this. Uh, transparently, I might say. So obviously Nginx could always know that it's got to get traffic to and from this thing, but it can just bind to 8080 and expect things to work. And your proxy can transparently get the traffic if it's able to set up these, do the privileged operations to set up these fairly brutal IP tables rules. So how does that work? Very briefly, well, as I said, there's no such thing as a container. We don't make a system call to say, I want a container, please. What Docker actually does when you say Docker run is it says, hey, I want a network namespace. And then it says, I want an IPC namespace and then a user namespace. So it builds most of these namespaces and then it can start running things inside them. Because remember, every container needs its own mount namespace. So we get this far and then we run, we make another mount namespace because that's the last thing in, in running a container. And we untar you know, a, a Docker image, a container image into it and we run the entry point. So what Istio does, for example, is it makes one of these namespaces and it untars this container image and it runs this command. And what this command does is set up those IP tables rules that it needs. But it does that and then that runs to completion and then it goes away. So this is a short-lived command. It doesn't listen on the network. You know, It just runs and, and sets up IT tables, IP tables rules and then finishes and goes away and is replaced by the sort of two running containers in this pod. 
The reason it does that is that setting up IP tables rules is a privileged operation. It requires capnet admin. So root will do, root's a superset of that, but specifically it needs capnet admin, I think, unless they've changed that. Um, but it needs some privileges that you wouldn't normally want things to have. So this thing runs with short, hopefully audited code for a short amount of time with that privilege. Ask the kernel to set up some ITP tables rules and then dies. And then these two runtime containers come in and they run with absolutely no privileges at all. Um, neither of these, you know, if either of these get cracked, they can't undo those IP tables rules. You know, they can't stop the interception. They can't do anything else with it because they don't have the privileges, even if you can pop a shell into them or there's malicious code into them. So these things sit in this, this sort of ambient environment in this network namespace with these really brutally intercept all IP tables rules, but it doesn't affect anything else. And that's how um, sort of traffic interception and sidecars work. Oh, this is going to work. So last point is this is how Kubernetes does it, but this is Docker London. So you can do the same thing with Docker. Like I say, when you say Docker run, you normally get one of these, but you can, with the right magic, build one of these by hand if you want to with Docker. And if you read the docs, You'll, most people probably know the, the, the network option to Docker run, right? Um, the default value is, is bridge. If you've never thought about why that is, you now know that it's because it literally says make a network and plug it, into, plug it into the bridge that's on this system to get it to the internet. Or you can say none if you want to isolate it. So that doesn't make any zero at all, doesn't plug it into any bridges. You can say host, which means don't put that wall up. You know, that, you know intuitively that means keep it on the host network, let it be ETH0, it sees is the host ETH0, not a magical separate one. And it means it has the host's IP and it can talk to other things on the host. But what it's doing is it's not making that VETH pair and it's not building that pink wall around your thing. It's building all the other walls, but it's not building the pink wall. That's what host mode networking actually does. One of the options that you probably haven't used is this thing that's container colon container name. And what that does is that says, I want a network namespace, but I want to be in that guy's. I want to point you to another container, and I want you to run my container in that guy's network namespace. Same with IPC. This is off literally the same page on docker.com, but the styling's different. Same with IPC. I can be no, you know, no IPC at all, host IPC, or I can point to uh, a container. Docker doesn't give you all of the options. The Docker CLI doesn't expose everything. So this is the best I could, I mean, I did this in the back of a planning meeting this afternoon, but this is the best I could come up with, which is I run Nginx. You have to kind of tell it ahead of time that you want the IP namespace to be like shareable. You have to tell it it's, it's gonna have friends, otherwise it complains. And then I can run Alpine and I can say, right, the networking is gonna be in the, in the same network namespace as the Nginx container. IPC is gonna be in the same one. PID is gonna be in the same one. Obviously, the mount namespace never can be the same, and it just doesn't seem to want you to do SHM or user. They just they just don't seem to be CLI options for it. Maybe I missed it. Um, but this was the best I could do. So I ran an Nginx, stuck it in the background. I ran an Alpine, with a, um, got a shell. And then when I said PS, I'm seeing the PS command that I'm running, the shell that fork exec it, and then the other two processes are um, Nginx, so Nginx got a pre-forking model. So I've got the Nginx master and then Nginx's pre-forked worker. So I'm seeing, empirically seeing processes from both of these containers. One is just Alpine running a shell. The other one is Nginx running uh, a non, well, a non a non-background, but still a, a pre-forking Nginx. Um, so there you go. That's how you do homebrew Kubernetes pods. But if you're using Docker directly or you're using Docker Compose, this can be really, really useful to do those kind of network or log exporting um, sidecar patterns. Because even though you can't share the file system you know, with the, if you share a PID namespace, as I say, there's some pretty simple hacks to just go, go get the file system with the other guy. Um, and they're not even hacks, right? I mean, you just read slash uh, proc slash PID slash root. Like it's, it's designed that way. Um, so you can go slurp logs out of sort of private parts of the other guy's container image. So I think, oh, we can't be, we're not going to do that. Uh, I think that's really all I wanted to say. Um, I hope that was an interesting tour of, of how networks work and how maybe containers work. Thanks. Does anyone have any questions? I mean, I know it's, it's late, but it's also kind of, I work here, so it's fine. <laughs> questions?
Yeah, thanks for the talk. I'm just wondering the last part. So is this what Docker Compose does when you um, start out a few containers and connect them together? No, they're separate. What? They're, they're separate containers. They have all of those namespace barriers up. What Docker Compose does is basically give you a nice way to start a lot of them. So if you remember that diagram where I had like the bridge and then just one container, what you probably want to do is run several and plug them all into the same bridge so they can, you know, they're a set of microservices. The front end can take traffic from the internet and then they can talk to each other. Um, you could do that with a set of successive Docker run commands in like a batch file, but Docker Compose, I mean, SRE is YAML, right? So Docker Compose basically gives you a, a, a YAML way of doing that because, because. No, but it, 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 it's declarative. It lets, you decla it lets you declaratively declare the network bridge. So you can, make a, you can actually make a second network bridge. If you've got several sets of microservices, you can make another one of those bridges. You can make a few containers, plug them into that bridge, and you can do all of that um, declaratively with Docker Compose. So if you want to add or remove one container, it'll work out what the diff is, and it'll just add or remove that one container rather than you having to, like, you know, everything down.sh, everything up.sh. But that's what, it, yeah, they are, they are separate containers. They're not so, sort of a pod arrangement. Cool. Any other questions? Speak now or forever hold your silence. <laughs> I'm going to edit that out. <laughs> All right, well, um, another round of applause for Matt. <laughs> <laughs>